Okay, I gotta say, these banners are juicy. Yep, they certainly are juicy. And they're terrible at the same time. Why didn't Shogun and Kokomi's rerun banners are finally here? If you want any of the characters on the banner because you like them or are just collecting characters, this video shouldn't convince you otherwise. As for those who are trying to make the most of their primo gems or are looking to progress further up the spiral abyss, listen up. This isn't an in-depth guide on each of the characters and weapons. I'm just going to talk about what the roles of these characters are and whether or not you should be rolling for them based on your account situation. Anyone watching the video who isn't familiar with the game's combat and different character mechanics yet, you can go to my Discord and ask me there, link is in the description, or if you want me to make videos about them, let me know in the comments. Raiden Shogun is my wife. Raiden Shogun is a DPS slash energy generator. In short, she lets you spam your team's bursts more often, much more comfortably. She isn't completely necessary to make certain teams work. The team she slots into already worked even before she came out, but she does make those teams much, much more comfortable to run and even allows you to build a bit less energy and more damage on your team. If you already have her and are looking to get constellations, C2 is a significant personal damage boost. I say personal because it only buffs the Raiden Shogun's damage. C1 and C3 are pretty good for damage too. In my opinion, someone going for C3 Raiden Shogun is the equivalent of you getting a Tesla. It's an expensive car, but it's worth it because you get all the fantastic features. You give something, you get something. And although C6 is also pretty good, it reduces your teammates' cooldowns, but it's the equivalent of getting a Lamborghini Centenario, but your office is only two blocks away. Genshin's hardest content currently is only two blocks away, but you're literally driving a two million dollar Lamborghini to go to work two blocks away from where you live. If you can afford it, great! And you do get something from it, but in most cases you won't be able to take full advantage of it. It's like you give a whole lot, and you only get something. Her best in slot artifact set is the 4 piece Emblem of Severed Fate set, which makes farming for her artifacts quite resin efficient since the other artifact set in that domain, Sheminawa's Reminiscence, can be used on so many other characters, and the Emblem set itself is just so good on so many characters. Her best in slot weapon is obviously her signature 5 star weapon, Engulfing Lightning. More on that later. Any other 5 star pole arm is the next best thing. For 4 star weapons, the catch is my first pick because it's completely free and is permanently available in the game at the low low price of your sanity. You gotta do a ton of fishing, but the reward for getting R5 the catch is definitely worth it. But literally almost every pole arm in the game is usable on her. If you already have good artifacts for her, congratulations. You just got yourself one of the best DPSs in the game. And even if you don't have good artifacts to make her do good damage, just her other role of energy generator itself will be enough to make you feel a significant change in your gameplay. Like if your main DPSs are energy hungry, someone like Yula or Shang Ling, she'll make spamming their bursts feel much less of a struggle. She's like one of those tools in your shed that just makes so many jobs much much easier to you, which just enables you to do more of that job. Kokomi is what I would call a comfort character, but may also be a necessity depending on what teams you're trying to build based on what characters you have. Her most common roles are Hydro Applicator and Healer, so she works for Freeze, Ganyu, and Ayaka teams. She basically has permanent off-field Hydro Application, but she doesn't apply Hydro quickly enough for her to work for Vaporize teams like Shang Ling, Hu Tao, or Diluc. You'll still need Shang Cho for those teams. Her parallel in terms of her role in Freeze teams is Mona. Something to think about is that Mona is a standard banner character, so you could literally get her if you lose 50-50 on any of the limited character banners or as you just continue to wish on the standard banner. So why would you use up your primos and pity on Kokomi? But there's also no guarantee when you'd be able to get Mona. So if you've already got your freeze team ready and you're just waiting to get a Mona from either losing 50-50 or from the standard banner but you just can't wait anymore to use your freeze team, Kokomi is at least the easier one to get among the two. Compared to Mona, she may be overall less damage because replacing Mona with Kokomi, you lose out on Mona's omen damage amplification, though whether Kokomi is more, less, or equal overall team damage versus Mona is debatable because it depends on a lot of factors such as your artifacts, weapon, and how you play. But even if she is overall less damage for the team compared to Mona, 
Her also being a healer makes it so on your freeze team, you can now choose to replace Diona with Shenhe if you have her. Though it is worth noting that you can turn Mona into a healer if you use Prototype Amber on her, a free craftable 4-star catalyst. But then you'd be losing out on either Mona's personal damage in case you have a 5-star catalyst for her, or the Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayer's buff. So there's certainly a lot to think about when deciding whether to get Kokomi or not, because she does have an alternative in a freeze team, and there's a ton of shuffling in the team you'd have to do for her to be actually an upgrade over Mona. You may also choose to make her into your main DPS. She's quite far from being the best at DPS, but I guess it's worth noting that you can build her in that way. She's got an unusual build too, seeing as she can't crit because of one of her passives, and the way she works is her damage scales with HP. One of her best in slot artifact sets is the 4-piece Ocean Hued Clam set, which may or may not be very resin efficient for you to farm depending on your account. The other artifact set in that domain is the Husk of Opulent Dreams, which is a defense slash geocentric set. So if you have and are building Geo characters that scale with defense like Albedo, Goro, Ito, and Noel, it's definitely a resin efficient domain for you to farm. Her best in slot weapon is highly, highly debatable because of the way she works. Everlasting Moonglow I think is one of the best options for her personal damage if you want to run her as a main DPS. Prototype Amber, a craftable 4 star catalyst, gives her HP. And its passive is literally healing, so if you somehow still feel like Kokomi's healing isn't enough, Prototype Amber should help solve that problem. Most people run her with Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers, a 3-star catalyst, so it's quite easy to get it to R5, or even get multiple copies of it at R5. Because it gives HP, which is what she wants, and it allows you to buff one of the characters on your team with 48% attack, which is no joke. You can use it to snapshot certain skills or bursts on your other characters and get a significant damage boost. If you guys don't know what snapshotting is, you can ask me on Discord or just look it up on YouTube, there are tons of videos about it. Or if you want me to make a video on it, let me know or you could just straight up ask me in the comments. It's not that complicated actually. As for constellations, C1 and C6 are personal damage buffs, C2 is a healing buff, and C4 is an attack speed and energy regeneration buff. The 4 stars on the banner kinda tell me that maybe Mihoyo forgot that Kokomi's here too. So rip. Bennett and Kujo Sara are two supports that run very well with the Raiden Shogun. In fact, both of them are in one of Raiden Shogun's meta teams, where she's the main DPS, and Bennett and Kujo Sara buff the heck out of her. Best boy Bennett okay. is no doubt one of the best characters in the game, and arguably the best character in the game. Just don't activate his C6 if you ever plan on using him with non-pyro melee units. He heals so much that you essentially become Wolverine for his duration. And on top of becoming practically immortal, the active character in his healing circle also gets a ton of attack, thereby significantly buffing them. His attack buff is based on his base attack, which means you just give him any high base attack weapon and you'll be golden. Of course, leveling up Bennett himself will give him more base attack, meaning stronger buff. Bennett has been the staple of almost every meta team since the game launched. He's so good that whenever I start a new account, he's the first character I wish I had. Put him on any team, and it'll instantly be better to varying degrees. His artifact set can literally be anything, making it so he'll give you most of what you need from him with very little resin investment. It doesn't matter much to his role of damage buffer slash healer, though most people run him with 4-piece Noblesse Oblige so you can get his buff and the Noblesse Oblige buff in just one ability. 4-piece Instructor set is also viable. Yes, a 4-star artifact set. It gives him 80 elemental mastery, buffing his own elemental reactions, which is what you'd want to do with him to activate the 4-piece set effect, which gives everyone on the team 120 elemental mastery, thereby increasing everyone's elemental reactions. While talking about Bennett doing damage, yes, he actually deals a pretty good amount of damage himself. So on top of being a healer and a damage buffer, he himself could also deal a good amount of damage if built well. Being Pyro, he's able to melt or vaporize his burst and skill, so you'd also want to build him with DPS stats like crit rate and crit damage. As for constellations, C1 isn't necessary for him to be the godly unit he is, but it certainly is one of the most useful constellations. Everything until C5 does something, but it's whatever. And like I said earlier, you don't want to activate his C6 if you ever plan on running him with non-pyro melee units. 
Kujo Mami is the hottest character in the game. Kujo Sara is like Bennett, but is a bit more restrictive in terms of gameplay and team building. She doesn't heal, she outputs about the same overall damage as Bennett would do if they were both built to be supports with DPS stats. She also buffs based on her base attack like Bennett, so giving her a high base attack weapon is the way to go. Her buff is quite short and it isn't easy to apply unless if you have C2, which makes gameplay with her quite a bit more skill capped and less leisurely. As for constellations, mostly only C2 and C6 are worth talking about. C2 makes it a bit less clunky to get her buff. C6 is a damage buff to only Electro characters. And I guess C4 is somewhat of a personal damage buff, but it's inconsistent and depends on what enemies you're fighting. So the weapon banner is where things get annoying. They gave us Engulfing Lightning, a weapon that so many people want, but since it's a gotcha game, trying to go for what you want, you might end up getting the donut. Something you would not want to get unless if you have Kokomi, but even if you have Kokomi, you still might not want the donut. Engulfing Lightning, amazing, amazing weapon on the Raiden Shogun, her best in slot by a significant margin, and is quite good on quite a few polearm DPSs. So it's a semi-universal weapon, and it's very good on the characters it's usable on. Everlasting Moonglow, however, is not. I mentioned earlier that it's not even Kokomi's best in slot weapon depending on how you want to use her. It may be what you need to bring out Kokomi's peak potential in terms of being a main DPS herself, but I also said even with the donut, she's still not in the same league as the top DPSs in the game. Now why is that important? Why do you want to have the best DPSs in the game? With the way MiHoYo is running Genshin, the only content worth pushing your characters to their peak potential really is in Spiral Abyss. The way they've been handling Spiral Abyss is every time they change the lineup, we need more and more overall damage every time we want to keep 36 starring the Abyss. They're always changing Abyss to suit the characters on the banners to make the players getting those new characters feel good that they got a good character. But when that lineup changes again, and your character doesn't suit the new Abyss lineup, that's where we have a problem. Where we'll really just need either more damage to still be able to beat Abyss, or to have the right characters. Maybe if you're a whale, that's not a problem. You can just pull for every character in the game and use the right character when you need to. But for low spenders and free to plays, that's not an option. So we have to pick what gives us the most value for our resources. So when I say Kokomi isn't in the same league as the best DPSs in the game, I mean that if you don't have a lot of choices when it comes to team building for Abyss changes, she won't be able to carry your team when the Abyss lineup isn't made for her. In any other situation that you don't want to use Kokomi as your main DPS, Everlasting Moonglow isn't her best in slot. It's Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers. But again, it's heavily debatable, really depending on your team, how you play, and what content you're doing. The 4 stars on the banner though. I can't remember all the other weapon banners off the top of my head, but I feel like this is probably the only weapon banner we've gotten that doesn't have a single garbage 4 star. They're all potentially usable on certain characters on certain team comps. Moyun's Moon, this bow here, and Aqua Maru, this Claymore over here, are pretty much the same. They're burst damage weapons, some of the best weapons for increasing burst damage. Favonius Lance, pretty much a default weapon for any support, especially if your team needs more energy, has good base attack, so despite not being a damage centric weapon, the high base attack makes it so your support can still do a decent amount of damage if built well. Sacrificial Fragments is in some cases a must have for Sucrose. It gives you the chance to reset your skill's cooldown and can be used on any catalyst character that you want to be able to spam your skill on. It gives Elemental Mastery as a substat, so anyone who can take advantage of Elemental Mastery, Swirl on Sucrose, Elemental reactions for certain characters can at least take advantage of this weapon. Pretty low base attack for a 4 star though, so it's not that great for damage really. It's mostly a niche weapon, but it's a niche that no other weapon can fill. Lion's Roar is actually a pretty good weapon on Xing Cho if you run him with the Raiden Shogun. Most of the time, Xing Cho wants to use Sacrificial Sword, which really doesn't do anything for damage, but it helps him so much to get his burst back sooner. But with Raiden Shogun, she fills a bit of that energy need, so running Sacrificial Sword on Shang Cho with Raiden Shogun actually makes it so you have too much energy for him. You'd be able to sacrifice some of that energy to get some more damage by replacing Sacrificial Sword with Lion's Roar. 
It's got an attack substat, and the passive makes Xingqiu deal more damage to enemies affected by Pyro or Electro. So in teams like the Raiden national team, this would be perfect especially if you have it at high refinements. Oh right, Jinyan. She plays rock and roll music. 